is from John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samarian city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. <coughs> it was about noon. A Samaritan woman had come to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, <clears throat> If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. <clears throat> Excuse me. The woman said to him, Sir, <clears throat> you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. <clears throat> the, thought, the water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. <clears throat> Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. This woman said to him, sir, I see you are a prophet. Our ancestor worshipped on this mountain, but you say the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship the what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. <clears throat> Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed for two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world, the word of God for the people of God. As you remember, across the summer, I've been preaching on questions or topics 
that you have submitted to me. And we're almost to the end of that, but only because we're almost to the end of the questions that I've got. So that, that offer is always still open. So send them in. If you're on live stream, wherever you want to send them in, I'll, I'll do them whenever. Uh, but today's question came as, what's wrong with calling God Father? So to kick that off, you know, there are a lot of passages that I could have picked. But I chose John, that long passage from John 4, verses 1 through 42, which is a passage where Jesus repeatedly does call God Father. I disagree with the premise of the question. I don't believe it's wrong to call God Father. But I think there are some serious issues if we only call God Father. And I think the story of Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well gives us a good touchstone for exploring those issues. So first up, I want to give you some context for the story you just heard. The setup is that Jesus and his disciples are moving from Judea in southern Israel to Galilee in the north. Better illustrate it this way. Um, that route usually took longer than it needed to because the region of Samaria sat in the middle of the two regions. Jews and Samaritans in the first century were bitter rivals. So rather than set foot on Samaritan soil, when Jews traveled from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north, they crossed over the Jordan River and they went through the desert to go all the way around Samaria so that they didn't have to cross the border. So it's breaking a taboo when Jesus marches himself and the disciples right across that border into Samaria and up to a well in the city of Sychar where he will send his disciples to go find some lunch. This also wasn't just any old well. This well was famous for being the place where Abraham's grandson Jacob had dug a well about 2,000 years before Jesus was born. So this is an iconic, historical, sacred site. That well today now sits within the complex of an Eastern Orthodox monastery in the city of Nablus in the West Bank. Here, at one of Samaria's most sacred locations, Jesus continues the taboo smashing by engaging with a Samaritan woman with a pretty robust marital history. Jesus asks her for a drink, which would have meant sharing from her cup, and she's as shocked about it as anybody. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? But no matter, if Jesus wants to have a conversation with her, then she is a game, and they begin talking. Even though we never learn her name, this conversation is the longest conversation that Jesus has with anybody anywhere in the Bible. It's also a substantive conversation. She is not cowed when Jesus lets her know he's aware of her history. She comes right back at him with one of the key points of tension between Jews and Samaritans, the proper location of worship. The Samaritans worshiped on Mount Gerizim, the Jews worshiped in Jerusalem. She throws down that challenge and Jesus engages with her, just as he does with his disciples, the Pharisees, or anybody else in the gospels. With that as background, let's weave in the question about calling God Father. Remember back at the end of May when we talked about the Trinity and how God, how the use in John of the word son for Jesus is a metaphor. Well, it's the same with addressing God as Father. God is not Jesus' literal Father any more than Jesus is God's literal Son. They're both metaphors. And the support for that, apart from just common sense and the traditional understanding of the Trinity and Christian doctrine, I think is in this story. The first exchange Jesus has with the woman at the well is actually very similar to the exchange he has with Nicodemus in the chapter just before. The content is different, 
But in both cases, Jesus is trying to stop someone from taking his words literally. In chapter 3, we have the learned Pharisee, Nicodemus, who helped to govern the religious life of Israel. He's part of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body for religious life in Israel. And Nicodemus hears Jesus say, you must be born again, and tries to get his brain around a grown man crawling back into his mother's womb. That leaves Jesus astounded that someone with the stature and education of Nicodemus has apparently checked his brain at the door. And Jesus says, are you a leader of Israel and you don't know these things? He's shocked. Here in John 4, a likely illiterate Samaritan woman makes the same mistake, but this time about water. Jesus says he could offer the woman living water. In a literal sense, living water in the Bible there meant running water, like a river rather than a spring or a well or a pool. So she too jumps to the literal words and said, yeah, give me that so I don't have to come here every day to draw water. This is heavy hauling this thing up and, up and down out of the well. I'll take the faucet in the house, please. Nope, that's not what he meant either. Just like being born again, the phrase living water is, guess what, a metaphor. And then the disciples come back with lunch, spanning the range of the educated tax collector Matthew to unlearned fishermen like Peter. When Jesus tells them he has food to eat that they don't know about, they're checking his pockets and wondering what Samaritan could possibly have wanted to offer a Jew hospitality and brought the guy some food. And Jesus again has to stop and correct them. My food is to do the will of the one who sent me. Jesus has several episodes of that with his disciples across the Gospels. So within just two chapters, you have Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman, and the disciples all making the mistake of taking Jesus literally when he's actually speaking in metaphors. And what's true in those stories around the edges is even more manifest at the heart of Jesus' conversation with the woman. Who's right about where we're supposed to worship, the Jews or the Samaritans? Jesus does answer that question and, not, no surprise, sides with the Jews. But then he quickly points out that the whole argument is really beside the point. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. With those words, Jesus obliterates all the debates about the technical and material aspects of our worship, both then and now. God is spirit and asks that our worship simply be filled with the spirit of truth. No matter who we are, no matter how or where we do it, no matter what words we use to address that great spirit who is beyond our ability to fully understand or articulate, excuse me, articulate. Our only tools for talking about spiritual matters are metaphors. And the Bible gives us a lot of them, actually. It's a treasure in a field. It's a pearl of great price. It's like a kingdom. It's like a city. It's like a garden. And encountering it is like being born again or drinking from a clean river of running water. Picking just one of those metaphors would be unwise and unhelpful. We see where the sole focus on born again has landed us. It's a great metaphor, but no one metaphor can contain the whole. The more diversity we have, the closer we can get to the ineffable spirit of God. It's the same with the metaphors used to describe God. The Bible is packed full of wildly diverse images of God. Father is one, it's a wonderful one. But picking only that one has had unintended consequences for us 2,000 years later. 
And that problem might be easier for us to see if we think about what might have happened if we landed on one of the other ones instead. In Psalm 62, God is called the rock of my salvation. That's a great metaphor. But what if we'd spent the last 2,000 years only addressing God as a rock? Sure, we'd understand God to be strong and a source of shelter, but we might also begin to see God as impersonal and unmoved by our prayers or our fears. Imagine growing up in the church from infancy with only the image of God as a rock. Would we easily think of God as being compassionate or forgiving? But the Bible doesn't just give us one metaphor. Rock works for some situations, but not for others. In Exodus 19, God is also the eagle who raises the Hebrew slaves up on her wings, riding the air currents high above the earth and off to freedom. But what if great eagle was the only way that we addressed God for millennia? What if every infant was only given the image of God as an eagle? I think we might end up more detached from the world around us. We might come to see faith as an escape instead of a path to engagement with others. And I shudder to think of learning to see God only in terms of a majestic predator. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. I can hear Nicodemus now. So we're all plants then? What if our only image of God was vegetation? Supple, nourishing, sure, but no match for a John Deere or a chainsaw. Jesus also likens himself to a hen wanting to gather her chicks under her wings. He says he's a gate to the sheepfold. God appears in the Bible as cloud and fire and whirlwind. The Holy Spirit is feminine in the Hebrew scriptures, wisdom personified as a woman. Each one adds more nuance to our understanding of God. But any one of them alone turns the living God into an idol of stone. Which is not to say there's anything wrong with having our own preferences as individuals. That's part of the point. We come from different places and find our connection to God more easily through some images than through others. In the Gospels, Jesus does prefer to address God as Father, many times using the more intimate term, Abba, the equivalent of Daddy. Well, doesn't that make it the right thing for us? Well, we believe Jesus was fully divine and fully human. Guess who disappears from the gospel story after Jesus turns 12? Joseph. Could it be that the humanity of Jesus was drawn to the metaphor of God as a father because he missed and needed a replacement for his own? Throughout the Bible, we have an enormous array of images for God. The discussion with the Samaritan woman makes plain that all of it is metaphor. God is spirit, not animal, vegetable, or mineral, not male or female, not Jew or Samaritan, not Christian or Hindu or Sikh. True worship will lift us beyond those distinctions. But because we keep taking Jesus' words literally, just like Nicodemus, the woman at the well, and his disciples on many occasions, we latched on to Father as the only acceptable way to address God and shoved all of the rest of those glorious images out. And it has hurt us. One set of people that it's hurt over time are those who've had abusive, negligent, or otherwise delinquent fathers. For them, it can be nearly impossible to reconcile a loving God with their own experience of their fathers. And when we insist that's how God always must be viewed and addressed, we either re-traumatize people or they, understandably, decide to love themselves enough to leave the church. It's not really a picnic for fathers either, 
who then bear the burden of thinking that they have to perfectly embody the love of God or shoulder what's really an outsized and unfair risk of ruining a child's faith. That's not fair to dads. The insistence that God can only be viewed and addressed as a father has also done extraordinary damage to women. It set the norm for only male authority in the church, and millennia of such a focus has discounted and diminished the equally valid but decidedly different way that women exercise leadership, solve problems, and foster cooperation in the world. It's led to turning a blind eye to violence against women and to normalizing economic hardship, not just for women, but for every society that doesn't elevate our gifts to the benefit of the whole. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Many, many books have been written on the impact of women of viewing God solely as father. I've been on the pointy end of that stick my entire life. People ask me if there's sexism in the church, and I respond, only on days that end in Y. <laughs> But as we rush to scrub the father and male language from our texts and liturgies, I urge us to proceed with caution. If we'd been raised only viewing and addressing God as mother, we'd have the same set of problems in reverse. And in part because of the limitations of English, if we leave out pronouns for God altogether, we're back to the issue of God as an impersonal rock. I think there's a better way. When it comes right down to it, Jesus tells the woman at the well, God is spirit, which can manifest as anything. God can, and I believe does, take an enormous variety of forms because humanity is diverse and God becomes known to us in whatever way speaks most clearly to us. That's what a loving God would do. If seeing God as a father is an obstacle because of your own life's experience, then try mother, or eagle, or rock, or vine, or gate, or even chicken. Our liturgies in our lives together shouldn't be this or that image. They should be this and that, and this other thing, and many more than any one of us can possibly imagine alone. Once we understand that father is a metaphor, that God is not literally male and a dad, once we realize that God can show up as literally anything on earth, think about what that could mean for our children and the world. If God can be a rock or a mother hen, a father or a vine, an eagle or a thundercloud, if we taught that to our children from infancy, would scientists need to order a code red for humanity? Might such children grow to see a forest as a manifestation of the sacred instead of a commodity for harvest? Laying hens are some of the most abused animals in all of our farming industries. If we'd been raised to imagine Jesus as a mother hen, would that still happen? If God might be in a cloud, would be, we be so quick to pollute it? If God might be manifest in women and children just as frequently as men, would their gifts, talents, and opinions start to matter equally? Might we begin to recognize the image of God that Genesis tells us is inside each one of us? Might suicide rates drop as we recognize our own sacred worth? that we, broken as we are, can still be a vessel for God's spirit. We will never in this life grasp the entirety of God, but every time we use a different metaphor for God, our understanding of God expands. And every time our understanding of God expands, we become a little more humble as we realize yet another aspect of God's nature that we'd never really considered before. How many more revelations might there be? A burning bush, a baby in a manger. God can get pretty crazy. 
It was six men of Indistan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, God bless me, but this elephant is very like a wall. The second, feeling of the tusk, cried, Ho, what have we here, so very round and smooth and sharp? To me, tis mighty clear, this wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal, and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. Tis clear enough the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, who chanced to touch the ear, said, Even the blindest man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact who can. This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing on its swinging tail that fell within his scope, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Indistan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. So oft in theologic wars the disputants, I ween, rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean, and prate about an elephant not one of them has seen. Amen. <laughs>